We've been hearing the warnings all through the holidays, and today, Boston Public Schools were feeling the effects. With more than 1,000 teachers and other staff out, many due to testing positive for COVID or having been exposed. And Boston is not alone in this, nor is it in seeing hours-long lines at testing clinics and people treating a find of an overpriced rapid home test at Walgreens like winning Powerball. And yet, despite all the staff shortage disruptions and hospitals filling up with the most coronavirus patients since last winter's surge, the public officials trying to curb COVID spread to keep us safe are getting more pushback than ever. Among them, Boston Mayor Michelle Wu, who, as she swore in the city council yesterday, had to compete with the chance of nearby protesters railing against her soon-to-be-imposed vaccine mandate. This year marks 200 years since this the town of Boston officially became the city of Boston. Mayor Wu joins me now. Happy New Year, I guess. Good to see you, Mayor. Happy New Year, Jim. Great to be back. Thank you so much. So places like Detroit, Newark, Milwaukee are doing remote schooling for at least a week. Are you convinced with all these people uh, not showing up uh, at work that you can keep in-person learning going here in Boston? We are doing everything we can to keep schools open. We know how essential schools can be for every part of a family's life and for our larger economy. Um, it, is, it is quite the balancing act at this point, and I just want to extend so much gratitude to the superintendent, our school leaders, and educators today, the first day back after school break over the winter. We had more than triple the number of absences as usual due to COVID and, and the sort of normal course of um, folks being in and out or, or not able to come in. So this is a lot that we're going through school by school, classroom by classroom, and uh, we're working hard to try to keep transmission rates low in the community so that our schools can stay open. But is there a plan B if you can't stay open? I think you said today it's all hands on deck. There are only how many, so many hands. I think I read That's 500 right. substitute teachers with almost 500 teachers already uh, out of work. What's plan B? Yeah, we are working closely with the state, but right now the uh, the guidance from the state is that schools must be open in person for this to count as part of the required school year. And so if we are at the point where we will need to close down a school building because of um, because, sorry, That's this, fine. I'm That's fine. running out of battery. Hold on, I'm going <laughs> to okay. plug in really quickly. <laughs> so sorry, Zoom world. <laughs> Running out of battery, also running out of substitute teachers, but uh, we'll get back to that in a, in a second. There you go. So you were talking about the uh, talking to the state about getting approval, I guess, for remote learning if necessary to count as one hundred one of the one hundred eighty required days. Is that where you're going? That's right. So at this point, if we get to the point where it becomes unsustainable at a school level to keep the doors open because of staffing shortages. Mm -hmm we will have to take it as a snow day and make that day up at the end of the year or at another point in the academic year. And so we are working our hardest, but so much of what happens in our classrooms is driven by the experience mm -hmm. of our communities. And so every step we can take to boost vaccination rates, to ensure we are yeah. allowing folks to work remotely where possible, that helps. One last quick thing. Are you ready for remote learning if it's necessary? As a district, we would have a significant amount of work to do. Right? We've been through this over okay. previous school years, but between the devices, the family engagement, uh, there's, there's a lot of work in, in changing over. 11 days till your vaccine mandate for restaurants, gyms, performance venues goes into effect. Any second thoughts? It's been, by and large, extremely positive feedback from all parts of the community. Business owners who, who say they feel a lot safer for their workforce and customers, Residents who say we're ready to go out again and, and make sure that we're supporting our local businesses because we will feel safer. And this is the exact tool that we have to end the pandemic is to get vaccination rates up and, and protect our entire communities. Well, when you say it's all positive, it's not I really, said by and large. <laughs> by, well, but a significant part of it wasn't positive. You visited us on the radio a day or two after you made the announcement. And here's what you had to say about some of the messages you received. Every time I open my phone, it's another dozen hateful messages. There's constant calls associating me with the same 
hateful, racist, xenophobic language that the former president used in describing the virus and its origins and who was to blame. And unfortunately, this isn't something that I bear alone. I know I can count on more than one hand the number of women of color elected officials in Massachusetts who have experienced similar hatred, similar you know, protests at events. Is that continuing, Mayor? I know the protests are, but a protest is a protest. Is this kind of xenophobic, racist messaging to you continuing? Unfortunately, we're in a moment in our politics writ large where there are deep divisions, deep mistrust, and a lot of misinformation out in the community. And so I know emotions are even more intense because we've been through the pandemic for so many months at this point. But we're, we're continuing forward because we must do what it takes to protect our community members. And that is the, 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 the best pathway we have to ensure that we can get out of this current COVID situation that we're in. But on this, so the answer is yes, it is continuing. Is that? Yes, it is continuing. Well, you know, I, I want to touch on one thing you said about women of color. There is another woman of color who has gone to a place where women of color had not been before. She was with me a few days before you, the soon-to-be new U.S. attorney for Massachusetts. Here's Rachel Rollins on a similar note. A lot of people um, don't recognize as women and as women of color, and particularly as a black woman, the level of racist, hate-filled death threats that we receive um, my security team is fielding calls with people using the N-word and saying they want to put a bullet in my head and, oh my God, you know, yeah. they know I have children. She sought protection from the U.S. Marshals. It was denied. What do you do about this? You don't just grin and bear it, I assume. What's to be done? You know, I'm grateful every day for so many in public service who are working to keep everyone safe and um, as... As I've stepped into this new role, uh, there are security protections and protocol in place as well. This is an unfortunate part of the job these days, but I know that what we are doing is in the best interest and for the public health and well-being of all of our communities. I am more than willing to absorb this if it means that we are lightening the load on our business owners who otherwise would have to face this backlash directly, on our students and families in schools who would otherwise be um, struggling to make sure that they can can continue putting food on the table because we're we're um, experiencing so many impacts of the pandemic. Well, respectfully, nobody should have to absorb that, but I hear you. Back to the mandate, uh, Mayor, most of the communities bordering Boston don't have a similar vaccination mandate in place. Would you be helped with those businesses that are concerned about it and those individuals who are, if there was a statewide mandate not unlike what you're doing in Boston? Oh, absolutely. And the, we have been working closely with our regional partners. So many of the fellow municipal leaders and, and um, businesses that, that are right across borders that no one would recognize when you're crossing over yeah. from one city or town to another, uh, we're all tied together and we're all deeply connected, whether it is on COVID recovery or climate change, housing and transportation policy. So we need to be working together as a region, as a state. And I know that this surge is, is very tough uh, over the next couple of weeks, but as much as we can do at the city level and then in partnership, we'll make a difference. Have you spoken to Governor Baker about it or you, do you intend to? I have spoken to Governor Baker. We're we're in communication on, on any number of COVID-related issues, on the schools, on larger policy. And, um, you know, Boston is a big driver yeah. in what happens across the state. And so I think it's important to make sure that we're in contact with our state officials as well. You know, it, it, one last thing about this event yesterday where the protesters were, where uh, you were swearing in the city councilors. Former Mayor Walsh was there as well. Did he ask for your support for governor? He did not ask for my support. You know, I have a great idea. If he does ask for your support, <laughs> you could leak his announcement sort of like he <laughs> leaked yours. Well, in any case, let's move on. One last We ended at a good place. <laughs> One you didn't ask him if he's running, did you? I did not. Okay. It was kind of hard to have okay. conversations. It was very loud. <laughs>
Uh, one last COVID-related thing. You said, I think your words were absolutely unacceptable, these endless lines. And not just Boston. I live in Cambridge. Same thing there. Virtually everywhere. What's the fix? What's the plan? We had a great meeting about this yesterday internally and came up with a couple immediate action steps. One is to expand the number of sites that are available. And even just yesterday, we launched a new site, a new testing site in the city of Boston in Alston. Our West End house is now up and running six days of the week. Walk-ins, welcome. We know that there's a huge appetite for walk-in locations and not just places where you can sign up and book an appointment because those are going very quickly. In addition, we're looking at plans for a higher capacity testing site. So it's not just geographically accessible across the city, but a large place that you know you can get through very quickly and the lines will move fast. And then we need to do better about managing the lines at each of the sites that exist now. So even starting in the next couple of days, we'll be working with each site. So they're in contact. If there's a long line, people can say, you know, just go down the street or over to this neighborhood. They have a, a wide open window and they're ready to take you. Is the president doing enough here? These 500 million masks that were promised, no date yet. 500 million to me, seem, pardon me, tests, not masks, seems like a drop in the bucket. Is the Biden administration doing enough on this front? We all could be doing more. And I've now been in this role for a little over a month. And you see how quickly the situation is evolving day by day, how intense the needs are, and how it just feels like we are rowing against the current in some ways. We need to be much more coordinated, and action from the state and federal government certainly is going to be critical to all cities taking action to uh, ensure that we're moving forward in the pandemic as well. Can I get a, qu a couple of quick responses to a few things that are, I know, central to the beginning of your uh, mayoralty? Uh, you've talked a lot about these three and implementing these three free pilot uh, uh, bus lines for two years. And I, I, from what I understand, the concerns some had about the federal government are being alleviated. Are, do you intend to do other pilots, initiate them during that two-year period? Or is the goal to wait you do? Is, that, is the answer to that yes? The answer is yes. And my biggest hope within that is that we will also coordinate with neighboring municipalities because many routes run across different cities and we can do that together. Uh, <laughs> next, uh, Mass and Cass. Is January 12th still the date to fully clear the encampment? Is it full speed ahead there? January 12th is still our key date. I took a trip with the team out to Long Island today to already begin to mm -hmm. assess medium and long-term uh, possibilities and, and ways to improve the situation. But we are working closely. We are 75% of the way there in terms of having actually place residents of the encampments into low threshold supportive housing or having matched them with a designated housing unit. And so the remaining um, placements, we feel very confident that we have the space for and have identified those uh, buildings and options as well. So the next couple of days we'll be continuing to engage as our teams already have been with people who are then connected to services and mm. the tents taken down. You know, one last thing that we've never, uh, at least I've never talked to you about is your support for the arts. I read a story in the Globe that was really heartening the other day about how you feel about the arts and what the city should be doing. One of the things you talked about was a sustainable revenue source to help supplement a whole variety of public art, uh, a whole variety of things. I think during the campaign, if I recall, you would propose doing something like uh, uh, directing 1% of the city's capital budget to arts-related things. Is that the sustainable revenue source or one of them that you're talking about? We need something much larger than that, but that has certainly been uh, what has been implemented in the city over the last couple of years was 1% of any new spending and capital budgeting goes to the arts. I think the bigger picture is that we need to recognize how fundamental the arts are to not only our humanity, but our economy, our recovery from this pandemic, our education system. I grew up in an immigrant family where the arts were able to help us transcend language barriers and really feel rooted in community. It's so central to how livable a city feels, how attractive we are, and how supportive and welcoming we are to our, each and every one of our residents. And so I'm excited, as someone who grew up immersed in the arts, to make sure that this is a key part of our agenda. Where's the rest of the money going to come from if this is a pittance, comparatively speaking? Where are you getting the money? We should have conversations about how we engage with the arts sector now and reforming the pilot program, the payment in lieu of taxes. We also need to be having conversations with the state about how to tie arts 
funding directly into our COVID recovery. You know, speaking of the impact the arts have, ha have had on you, I want to show you uh, uh, an image of a Boston resident on City Hall Plaza. I think it was maybe five years ago. Here she is. She looks very much like you, <laughs> Michelle Wu. I had no idea you were a classically trained pianist and how important the piano was in your life until I read that Globe story. You called it the love of your life. Could you expand <laughs> upon that? I'm serious for a minute. Well, and you it, also had a piano days, moved into your <laughs> Exactly. Your I don't office. have to go out to the plaza anymore. I could do it right in the mayor's office. Um, I, I grew up playing piano. My mom sang. Multiple of my siblings played instruments and it was always a way to feel grounded in, in who I am. Before any of the, before each of the mayoral debates, I would spend some time playing piano and just clearing my head. And for me, it's 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 deeper than language. It's deeper than just a, a sort of something you do for fun or enjoyment. Um, it's it's critical to who I am. And I know that the arts have such power to connect us, to heal us, and to be part of creating community. So before you go, do you ever get up from your desk in your new office and walk over to the upright and just start playing Rhapsody in Blue or something? What do you do? You play it? <laughs> yes, I do. Actually, you do. <laughs> so sometimes I close the door, sometimes I don't, and it's part of the uh, ethos of the mayor's office these days. Let me tell you something. There is an open invitation to you any day when we return to the studio here for you to play anything you want. So please consider it a uh, standing invitation. Okay, we'll do it, right, Jim? Do you play anything? Uh, I can play the autumn leaves with one hand. That's <laughs> about it. Uh, Mayor, Let's do it. good luck with everything. Happy New Year. Thanks so much for your time tonight. I appreciate it. Happy New Year. Thank you.